please stand and join us? There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the water holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears a burden where another died for me there is another in the fire All my death left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There's another in the fire standing next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds no body, and now that power lives in me. There's another in the fire. There's another in the fire, oh, there's another in the fire, oh, there's another in the fire, oh, and I can see the light in the darkness, as the darkness bows to him, I can hear the roar in the heavens, as the space between wears thin, I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name them that is Jesus. He who was and still is and took me through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding how good you've been to me i'll count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be and i can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between roars thin, I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us, nothing stands between to be another in the fire. Standing next to me, there'll be another in the waters holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding? How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause 
Everybody, I have announcements with Pastor John Vaughn with celebrating Marsha's graduation and her marriage yesterday. Your time down there, Vaughn? Yeah, I bet it was. Let me put my readers on. Okay, and Royce is going to be bringing our message this morning, so that's great. And uh, just to let you guys know, we continue with Bible basic classes on Sunday mornings over in the New Horizon building, currently doing the Authority of the Believer, and that's for men and women. And then we have our Sunday Youth Connection on Sunday mornings with Royce. And then Wednesday a.m. this week, um, we meet at 10 a.m. for prayer, and then sometimes eat out afterwards. And then on Wednesday nights this week, we're going to have our prayer, prayer for the nation, 6.30 to, to 7.00. Um, and we have Wednesday night refuel with the kids, Amped and Junior High, and then Super Kids meet with Jane, um, and that's at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. And then we have the 40th anniversary banquet coming up first weekend of June, that Saturday and Sunday, the 5th and 6th. Today is the last day to RSVP for the banquet meal. If you haven't done that yet, and you can put your check for $10 in the metal box, Blue Dot, or in the offering probably too is fine. Um, and then Sunday afternoon, Pastor Patsy's gonna be speaking here, and then we will have an open house from two to four Sunday afternoon. Um, and then as a, you guys give your tithes and offerings, um, our missions project for the month is Rama Day. So just circle the word missions and write in your amount on that. And we have the building repair project still going on. Carpet will get started soon here. And then we still have Covenant Cedars Camp raising money still to send the youth, the youth to camp this summer. 13 kids are going to camp. And then, yeah, then, then this year, um, Can Caravan is still on again, June 14th, 9 a.m. to noon here in town. And we have a basket in the foyer for non-perishable food items for you to um, participate in that or you can make a check payable to Knuckles County Food Pantry and give that to Don Weiss. He's the treasurer. And then this year, this summer, we're going to have a one-day vacation Bible school. One day on Saturday, July 24th, from 10 to 2.30. We are also, um, Carl Hibna is going to come down from Oklahoma, and he's going to do parenting classes at the same time. So you guys watch for details on that and how you can help and be involved in that. Mark that date on your calendar. And um, congratulations to the upcoming graduates. Those are listed there. And we do have, um, I do have a new one listed, uh, Leah Covey, um, former member, Sabrina Covey, her daughter, um, graduated this past Friday down in Missouri. And then our Bible study opportunities, good morning, ladies, Monday morning at Arlitz at 10. And then Pastor John's Grub and Grow, 2.30s at 7 with a meal here. And then Healing School will be this Thursday, 2 o'clock. And then um, Healthy Living Class will not resume until Monday, June 21st here. And then um, we have a prayer, um, the prayer for the nation, um, prayer for Israel and America's relationship with Israel. Um, and so then I just want to take a minute and um, Caitlin... She's downstairs. Okay, we're gonna. I was gonna go ahead and do that now. Is that okay? We we have a special for Caitlin Hartman, Janice Hartman's granddaughter, right now. Brass horn. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not gonna sing. Yes, it is. We need 
the moisture. The corn is growing and the gardens are growing. Or do we not have We wish the grass was the moisture. Is the lawn the same? attends second grade. Um, which school? Red Cloud. Red Cloud. Red Cloud Elementary Second School. And every year at the end of summer, um, they have a track meet for the kids. And we just wanted to show um, um, what Caitlin, Caitlin here, on second grade in her track meets, she got first place in all of the events, second place in one here, and she walked a total of 10 miles in accumulation before school and um, made the 10 mile club. She got first place in the 400 meter run, the 50 meter run, the 200 meter run, the soccer ball dribble, the, the kickball, standing long jump, um, second place in the soccer dribble first place in the long jump, first place in the Nerf football throw, first place in the softball flow, throw, the backwards run, and the ball raise. So congratulations. Good job there. And we can go on back down with, for the children's trip share. Thanks, Caitlin. Good job, Caitlin. sprinkled out a little bit when we're coming to church. <laughs> Dennis, did you ride your bicycle this morning? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I understand. All right. My name is Don Lee, and Pastor John asks me every once in a while to take up the offering, so here I am again. Good morning, everyone. All right. So we have different things that Tina mentioned in the offering. I'm sure you all have your offering envelopes ready. So... We just want to thank God for all that he does for us, the blessings that he imbues upon our lives. And the reason why he does that is because he loves us. Now, he would do that whether or not we give anything in the offering. So I hope you understand that. But I also hope you understand that our tithes are due to the church that we attend. So everyone has that prepared. And if you want to give offerings over and above that, We'll receive those and pass them on to the locations where you indicate, whether it be to our building fund that will stay right here, or to Raymond Day, or to whatever needs, uh, like the camp. We've been supporting the camp this year somewhat because they didn't weren't able to have camp last year, so they needed extra money. So we've been doing that too. So I appreciate that. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Well, thank you, Father God, for the offerings and tithes that are coming in this morning. We just ask your blessing upon it. And we will say our confession now, and we believe it in our hearts, and we receive from you in Jesus' name. As I tithe and give offerings, I believe in you, Lord, for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits and promotions, sales and commissions, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills decreased, bills paid off, blessings and increase, and greater victories in the midst of greater odds. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my needs, and I may have more than enough to give to promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 
Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me? I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a to fight for me. the darkness flee. an anchor for my soul through every storm I will hold to you with endless love all my fears
worship you. You are here, mending a broken heart. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working waymaker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. You're so good. So good, so so worthy, so deserving to be worshipped and praised, uplifted. We just invite your, your presence, your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning, Lord. We open our hearts to hear from you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that your words are what will be heard. I ask you to use me to minister to your word to your people, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here today, Lord. Just open up their hearts. Thank you, Lord, to receive from you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. May we always
always yearn for your presence, your, your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You, you may go ahead and be seated. So in the tradition of Pastor John, I'm going to give a joke this morning. <laughs> and this is one that you probably have heard before, but it's, it kind of goes with my sermon this morning, and, and I, I really enjoy it, so I wanted, I wanted to use this one again. Um, there was a battleship that was on a, an exercise at sea in inclement weather. It was foggy, it was getting dark, and the captain of, the, of this battleship was watching from the bridge, watching uh, the exercise take place, when he noticed there was a light off in the distance, off the starboard bow, and for those of you who don't know, that's just almost like straight ahead off to the right, and um, he asked uh, his crewmen if, if the light was, was it veering or was it, was it just not, it doesn't look like it was changing, and they said it wasn't changing, which means you're on a collision course with this light, whatever it is. So we had his people radio to, for the other ship to um, turn off 20 degrees. And um, surprisingly, the ship came back, was signaled back that uh, you changed your course 20 degrees. And, you know, it's not very easy for a battleship to turn around. So he said, you know, this is a captain of, of a battleship. You turn around. You turn off 20 degrees. And... The uh, voice came back, well, this is a seaman second class. You change your course. And the captain is so furious. He's like, you change your course right now. This battleship is going to go full speed ahead. And uh, the voice came back, well, this is a lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> so anyway, I always enjoyed that. It's <laughs> very humbling to for a captain, I'm sure, to hear something like that from uh, someone low class. But, but this morning... Um, uh, you know, I had a, a message that I actually was working on for a little bit, and I was all excited to give it. It was, uh, I don't know, just something that interested me, and I thought it was going to be a great message. But God had something else in mind. And so, you know, we need to be obedient, even when we're not comfortable. Um, and so I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and give this message this morning instead. And what I want to talk about this morning, the title of my message is, it's the little things, which is, which is so um, <laughs> relevant today, just trying to get Facebook Live to work, all the things you have to go to. Um, downstairs, I don't know if you saw, they were asking for me to come help downstairs because the video wasn't connecting downstairs. And it always seems like there's just some little thing, whether it's just one little switch, one little uh, item's not turned on. And... Um, I, when I was trying to prepare for this message, um, I called a friend last night because I wasn't feeling very comfortable about giving this message. And it was really neat because this is someone I haven't seen in over 20 years. And, and uh, you know, I, I know they're a Christian, but I didn't know how strong spiritually they are. And they just kind of really spoke to me that someone needs to hear this message, that, that the fear and the attack that the enemy was trying to place on me about giving this message was because someone needed to hear it. So whether you're, you can hear me through Facebook, if that's even working, um, or someone here today, um, God wants to speak to your heart. God wants to speak to you directly. So there's a few aspects. There's many different directions I could go with talking about the little things, but I'm going to go in a specific direction, but I do want to uh, just touch on a few other 
uh, items. You know, have you ever heard the timeless phrases like, big things come in small packages, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. Um, you know, you hear that oftentimes with, associated with sports. And, um, you know, there's some other quotes that, you know, me, I, I uh, have a background in business, so I like business things. So here's a few business quotes. It says, successful people are simply those with successful habits. And our habits are what we do every day, the little things. Um, we first make our habits, and then our habits make us. That was by John Dryden. Um, your habits will determine your future. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. Um, you know, how true is that in our daily lives uh, as Christians? There are certain things we need to do, the little things, even if we only have a little bit of time. But it's important to do those daily things, those weekly things, prayer, um, reading the word of God, spending time in his presence. And, you know, even even as simple as coming to church faithfully. It's so neat to have a church that while Pastor John and many of our musicians, so many people are gone uh, on vacation. There was, of course, Marcia had her wedding. Um, it's so neat to see the people be faithful because that is so lacking in society today, to be faithful. Um, I, always, I always remember the G.I. Joe quote from their cartoon is, you know, basically, you know, knowing was half the battle. The other part was showing up. So <laughs> if you just show up, that, that's half the battle. And so it, um, if you could go ahead and show that picture. Just, Pastor John did ask me to show you a picture this morning. And I think you'll be blessed by it. It's just what a, what a testimony, what a blessing. I received this early this morning while I was preparing. This is uh, Marcia and her new husband. So, <laughs> so, the little things, right? It, I, I see all the warm faces. It's funny how just one picture, one little picture, just kind of touched everyone's heart. It, you know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, that picture might be worth a million. <laughs> so, so anyway, but so again, I want to talk about the little things. And and first of all, when it comes to little things, as I was talking about earlier, everything going wrong. There is a, a, a bad side to the little things, but there's also a good side. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, the bad side of things, that things can get to you. They can get you. Um, my mom and I, one time, were eating, uh, were eating at Golden Corral in uh, Grand Island. I think they're closed now, aren't they? Okay. And there was a fly in the butter. <laughs> and I can handle a lot of things, but that was one thing I couldn't handle. Lost my appetite right there. And they gave us a full refund. They were sorry. But just seeing that thing just creamed in there, that was it. You know, it was, it was done. Um, you know, and so little things can get you. Um, you know, even think about, so I was talking to you about the ship. You know, if you think about it, uh, what causes a ship to sink is not the water around it. It's the water that gets inside of it, right? And it doesn't take much to let water in. And that, that includes our lives, the world trying to influence us. You know, um, the you know I was thinking of that ship, uh, Titanic. You know, at, at the time I believe it was the largest cruise liner ship in the world, and um, they they thought that there was a huge, probably a hundred meter gash across the the side of the ship, and it filled up over the tops of of the the sides in, inside. And of course, sank the ship. It took about two hours to sink, but that's still a pretty big ship to sink in two hours. And actually, they found out that the ship took only five minutes. Once it sank just underwater, it only took five minutes for it to reach the bottom of the ocean. And that may not seem like much, but you got to realize it sank in over 12,500 feet of water. So it only took it five minutes. So oftentimes in life, when things just get you a little bit, start to sink, and then once you go under, it just goes downhill real quick. So we gotta be careful, we gotta keep ourselves afloat. You know, it's funny, they were, you know, when they found and discovered the, the wreckage of the Titanic, they were assuming, again, that that, that huge gash based on um, eyewitness testimony and the people of that iceberg hitting it. And so when they actually did an analysis on the hull, they found actually it was only tiny little holes that amounted to, I think, 1.1 square meters of, of a hole that sank the entire ship. So it doesn't take much. 
So little things can knock us off course. You know, you think of a ship that's um, set out to sail for a destination. Um, if it's only off one degree, if it goes off, maybe goes a short distance, you won't even know that you're off. But you get further down, further down, you could be so far off, you won't even recognize where you're at. And also, can, it can put you into to dangerous waters. I mean, look at the Titanic in, you know, sailing into um, you know, water filled with icebergs. So you know, it, it is important to be careful of the little things. You know, and, and, and little things in life will, will, you know, God will reveal those little things to you. And, and he'll do it through different ways. He'll do it through your word, through his word, through your spirit, and other people sometimes. And, you know, we were having men's group, and, you know, me, politics and stuff. And, and of course, I was making jokes about a certain political figure that it's not very hard to make jokes about. And Pastor John, um, he kind of was, you know, I feel a check in my spirit that that's not right. We shouldn't do that. And I felt convicted. You know, in, in Proverbs, it says the rebuke of a friend can be trusted. Pastor John's a trusted friend, isn't he? And I'm so thankful. And I said, Pastor John, you're so right, and, I, and I'm sorry. And he was like, well, I wasn't trying to make you feel bad. And I'm like, no, I should feel bad. You know, uh, you know I'm supposed to be a, a youth minister, and uh, people see me all the time. I should be doing the right thing. So little things, we need to correct those things. When those things come upon us to that opportunity to correct, we need to correct them. You know, even when David got off course, I love his reaction. He quickly repented. He is, I have sinned. He didn't try to make excuses. So many people try to try to deflect, give excuses. Let's not do that. Let's be humble. Let's let's receive correction. Let's receive that course correction that we need to get back on track. Okay. Um, you know, and again, the little things, it doesn't take much. It's so dangerous. You know, you think about the coronavirus. Look how much destruction it did for something so little. We can't even see it. Um, I actually looked up what the size of the coronavirus was. And, you know, coronavirus is less than one micrometer. It's between a half and one micrometer. And just to show you how small that is, so let's say it's just under one micrometer. Um, it's... Red blood cells are about seven micrometers across. So it's one seventh, or it's actually smaller, one seventh the size of a red blood cell. Um, and, and a strand of hair, human hair is about over 100 micrometers. So it just shows you how small and something destructive something can be. And Jesus talked about, we're supposed to be on guard uh, from the yeast of the Pharisees, talking about that. And, and Paul later talks about in Galatians, it says, this false teaching, teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch. So it's important. That's why it's so important for us to get into the word. So we can hear that, that there's so many things being said in the world, and people will just say it, and it sounds so true. But when we compare it to the word, it doesn't stand up. So we need to be careful. you know. And, and even, again, our thoughts and our desires, James 1, 15 says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives uh, birth, uh, brings forth death. So, you know, we need to be careful of the things. And so one of those things to me, again, talking about the tongue, and if we could turn to James 3, I want to talk about this. Again, this is just kind of the negative side. I want to focus on the good side of the little things, but I do want to make sure I, t I touch on this a little bit. You know, the, the tongue can be so destructive. What is coming out of our mouth? You know, it, it's a good check to see what's in your heart, what is coming out of your mouth. So obviously I hadn't been praying for our political leaders the way I should be based on what I was saying. Um, and again, I'm always thankful for, for people to, to tell me that out of love, you know. It's out of love that God corrects us and he uses people. So in James chapter 3, and I'm just going to start with verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 12. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, again, ships as an example, 
Although they are so large, they are driven by, and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set, of, what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures in, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue our praise, we praise our, Father, our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. And we have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be, isn't it? You know, I find my, myself doing that sometimes. Like, here I am praising God, and then I'm, I'm putting forth a, a cursing towards people. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So only one thing is going to be able to come out of your mouth. So always have a check is what's coming out of my mouth. And that's even in faith, you know, speaking out over our own lives. You know, I love how it used uh, a deadly poison here. I was thinking of this example. How many drops of water or how many drops of poison do I need to put in the water before you would not drink it? Something little, right? And, and so we got to be careful. Uh, again, what, what are we poisoning? Are we poisoning our own wellspring of life that's supposed to come out of us? So now I want to talk about the good things. I want to, this is where I want to focus. Little things can be so great. You know, you think about when Saul, um, and we can turn there real quick, uh, 1 Samuel 9, 21, when Saul is, is going to be anointed king, I love his reaction. And, and it's so funny that most, you'll find most of uh, the people in the Old Testament had similar reactions um, or many of them had similar reactions to what Saul had, and we're going to go over a few of them. So 1 Samuel 9, 21, it says, Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you such, say such things to me? So he, he just can't believe it because he feels like he's so small. He, who is he? Even not only is he small, but his whole clan, his family is small. But you know what? God, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Thank you, thank you Lord, for using me. <laughs> Maybe I'm confounding some wise people. Um, and then, you know, then I want to talk about David. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I love the story of David because... Again, the one thing about the Bible compared to any ancient text, even if you're an atheist, you have to admit the Bible told it like it was. It didn't tell it pretty. It didn't tell it nice. It told it like it was. It told the truth. And no other ancient text does that at all. They always, you know, well, many of them, I'm sure, fear for their, their king would behead them or their, or like Pharaoh would... <laughs> would do something if they actually published some of the things that they published about David. The king might not like that, but, but the Bible tells the truth. It's the truth. It's the word of God. So 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 1, it says, <clears throat> and I'm going to read through, through, um, through verse 13. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? So he's upset because Saul has been rejected as king, okay? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, and I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint me for me, the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to, sacrifice, come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely 
the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called to Abinadab and, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, and Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So can you imagine, okay, these are all, these are all the sons. What's going on here? And then um, he says, Jesse, okay. He says, so he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Well, they're still the youngest. Um, he's, he, uh, he answered, he is tending the sheep, Samuel said. Send for him, and we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was going with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel went to Ramah. You know, uh, I find it funny that, you know, if Samuel the prophet were to come to your village, everybody better be there, especially the, the men were called to be there. And they didn't even bother to go get their little brother. Especially imagine uh, prophets coming in to call forth a king out of your line. Let's say uh, your, your children, a prophet came to your home and said, okay, it's going to be one of your kids is going to be anointed leader of, of the world or the, the, the United States. You wouldn't leave one behind. You would bring them both. You'd bring all the ones. In fact, you'd be bringing, you know, I'm trying to think, make sure I got everybody, you know, right? <laughs> make sure I got them all there. They didn't even bother to bring David. Oh, he's just the little kid off watching the sheep, right? So it's the little things, the small things. God loves to use the small things because it brings him glory. You know, even this morning to get up here, it took the faith of a mustard. Uh, that's my, my, my faith, I feel like, right now, was the faith of a mustard seed to get up here and to preach this message. But that's all it takes. And so the next character I want to go over, if we turn to Judges chapter 6, I want to go over the story of Gideon. And again, I know I'm reading these through, but, but there's so many important things that, that we need to see in here, in, in this passage of scriptures. And my mom told me, I, instead of just reading, she said, you need to give people time to turn to them. And I'm like, okay, because usually I just read and just go forth. So again, I'm, I'm heeding my mother's advice. The rebuke of a friend can be trusted. So <laughs> Judges chapter 6, this is Gideon. Gideon is probably one of the Bible characters I feel like I identify with the most. Because he's always like, huh, me? And we're going to see that, right? So chapter 6, it says... It says clearly here, starting off, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their, their crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, <clears throat> neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. Sounds like a lot of people and a lot of stuff, right? It was impossible for, to count them or the cam, their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of your, all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave, the, uh, gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened. So clearly he's saying why they're having trouble, right? And the angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak in Ophrah, that belonged to Joash the Eberzite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in, in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So basically, Gideon's kind of hiding, trying to get this wine press going, trying to hide it from the Midianites. Okay, and so this angel of the Lord appears and says, "Mighty warrior." <clears throat> well, he's hiding. That doesn't sound like a mighty warrior to me. And this is what he says, and I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, 
pardon me, my Lord, doesn't sound like a mighty warrior, <laughs> Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Well, what, didn't the prophet just say why? Where are all his wonders and, and all that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? So he's even quoting what, the, what was said before. But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. Midian. So, mighty warrior, huh? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the hands of Midian. Am I not sending you? Again, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Sound familiar? And I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and I will strike down the Midianites and leave none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Faith of a mustard seed, right? And, and so I'm going to skip ahead a bit <clears throat> to, to verse 36. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece, and, on the, the, and the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, and, and, as you have said. It's funny, he's doing it again, right? You know, it's not like David, David was kind of told, and David just kind of did it. He's asking, you know, just to make sure. I just want to make sure, right? Then, and, and then it happened, as, uh, th and then that is what happened. Gideon rose up early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the crown be covered with dew. That night, um, that night God did so, only the fleece was dry and the ground was covered with dew. So again, he was, he was questioning God. But again, you know what? He's considered a hero of faith. Did you know that? Faith of a mustard seed. That's all God is asking is if that's all you can muster up is the faith of a mustard seed, step out, speak out, do what God has called you to do. So chapter 7, verse 1, and, and I'm only going to read a little bit of this. It says, early in the morning, uh, Gideon and all his men camped at the, the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of, of Mora. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. So imagine before we were talking about there were so many of them, they couldn't even count them. They, they were like a swarm to them, right? But God is saying, oh, you got too many people. And these are the same people that were completely frightened, right? And it says, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me, is what they'll say. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 20,000 men left while 10,000 remained. So there was only even 10,000 of them that were brave. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from, uh, as a do uh, since I lost my place, as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Again, small group. Why did he do that? So he would receive glory. Otherwise, they here, here they were frightened of the Midianites, completely afraid to even try to attack them because they, they did not number, the, the numbers were not even comparable. And the Lord is concerned about them being boastful. Look what we did. It, it just doesn't paint a good picture. But thank God for for. 300 people and Gideon being obedient to the word of God. So it's, it's important to see that we, we always step out with the little things because the, the verse, uh, and you don't have to turn here, Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with the little things can be trusted with much. 
Um, and so it's important to be trusted with the little things, the little things, being faithful, stepping out in faith, faith of a mustard seed, step out with that. Even, even if we see that when um, Jesus is talking about uh, the little children, this is in Luke chapter 9, verse 40, it says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. And the reason that's so important to, to see is because sometimes we think of ourselves as small, nobody, or what I do is no big deal. And we, we cannot think like that. We really have to change our mindset. And I want to show you a clip, uh, just a short clip. This is a clip of, uh, does anyone know who Captain America is? Okay, I think everyone pretty much does. This is a little sh a clip from a movie where Captain America, before he's chosen to be Captain America, this is who he is and what he looks like. And I think it's just kind of perfect with our, with our message this morning. <laughs> Captain America, <laughs> he got married. <laughs> <laughs> He's still skinny, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's who they would eventually choose to become Captain America. They chose him because of what was in, on the inside of him, what was inside his heart. You know, you think about it, uh, the, the Bible says that we're the temple of God. So no matter how, how small we are, we're still the temple of God. And God can fit in little us and be so big. You know, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? The same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And when you think about that, when th that same spirit, that same that spirit took Jesus Christ out of the lowest low and put him to the highest heights. There's been no greater display of power that we've ever seen in human history. And so that power is inside of you. You know, I was thinking about it, all the things, the little things that we do around here. I was thinking washing windows or toilets. And we, we sometimes if somebody asks, you know, oh, what do you do there? Well, you know, oh, I... I wash the windows for LFFC, <laughs> you know, right? Doesn't sound much, but we need to change that perspective. You wash the windows at LFFC. You wash windows for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what we do, right? We, we need to make sure we have that proper perspective that we are doing this from the Lord or for the Lord. And when we do that, it says we will have success. We're supposed to dedicate what we do to the Lord, and we will have success. But it's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost a humbling thing to say something like that. Because if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, what can he do through us? You know, the, the name Saul, when Saul became Paul, I looked at what Paul actually means. It means small. Paul means small or humble. It's funny that they would change his name from Saul, which was his proper name, and give him this nickname of small or humble. And it might have something to do with his appearance. He wasn't considered huge in statue. But look what God used. He wrote most of the New Testament, right? Here he was persecuting Christians to the man that God is using to write the, the, most of the New Testament. It's the little things. You know, I looked up, uh, or, you know, when you think of the definition of a Christian, I always think of a follower of Christ, because it, it does talk about that, we're a follower of Christ. But, you know, there are people who are trying to follow Christ that are not Christians. So what really defines a Christian? 
Well, to me, the, the true definition of a Christian is, is Christ in the, inside of them, right? Is Christ in you? That really is the litmus test, because there are people doing things in the name of the Lord, and they're not Christian. It's, is it Christ in you? You know, I have this belief that, that God is confident in, in us. And you know why? Why is he confident in us? It's because he sees himself in us. It's not us that he's confident in. It's what he sees inside of you. And he sees himself. He sees his own light inside of you. And that should encourage us because that's what we're supposed to look to. We're not supposed to look to our failings, our shortcomings. We're supposed to look that, hey, the Lord is in me and I can go do it. Kind of like Gideon, mighty warrior. Am I not sending you? We, we need to find those, that direction from the Lord. And if the Lord says we can do something, then he will equip us to do it, regardless of what it looks like. You know, I look at Moses. You remember he was kind of giving God these excuses. I can't do this. I'm not very learned. I'm not very good at speech. Even though he's educated by the, by the royalty of Egypt. So God doesn't let him have an excuse. He tells him, well, I'll send, I'll send your brother with you. But yet, who's still doing the speaking when they get there? Abraham. It wasn't that really a problem. He's just trying to back out, right? And we, we shouldn't cower from those things, regardless of how, how big our statue is, how big we think we are, how, how little our, our tasks are in front of us. You know, you think of some, again, some of the, the greatest names in the Bible, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Daniel. They were just kids. And yet, look what God did through them. You know, I want to read... Uh, Another little passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 26. And while, while you're turning there, I'm going to read some things. So Matthew chapter 26. But um, in 2 Corinthians, it says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest upon me. We're supposed to boast in our weakness. You know, when Paul talks about I must decrease that he might increase, again, we need to take ourselves out of the equation. We need to let God work through us. Let it be him that he might receive the glory. So Matthew chapter 26, and, and I want to thank my wife. She's the one who, who reminded me of this story. And it says, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume. When she poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why waste this, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but I will not always you but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly I tell you, what wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is recorded in all four gospels. We are still using this story today. For her just to be obedient, and you keep in mind, she was a sinful woman. It may have been hard to approach um, Jesus, everything going on, but she knew in her heart that's what she was supposed to do. She was led by God to anoint Jesus for his burial. God used her, and her name, or in this memory of her, is th held throughout the world. You know, we're oftentimes compared as, as little sheep in the Bible, and I think that's kind of appropriate because sometimes they get into trouble, they need help. You know, sheep are actually not as dumb as people think they are. They just do dumb things. <laughs> they found that sheep are actually quite intelligent. They just do dumb things. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, like, yep, that's me. I do dumb things. But you know what's really amazing? I, I love the stories about the Bible with, when it comes to sheep. It says that he left the 99 to look for the one. And when that, really, when that really settles in your heart and you realize you were the one he was looking for, the little things, 
That always gets to me. You know, you know the story of Barabbas <clears throat> when um, Jesus is set to be crucified and Pilate tries to make a way of getting out of this and presents to the people, um, who do you want to release? Barabbas, who's a criminal, he's a murderer, he's, he's a mess. This guy's not good. And you have Jesus who is healing, loving, innocent, perfect. And they want Barabbas set free, and they're yelling to have Jesus crucified. What kind of people, what kind of people would do that? And, and talk about indignant. Every time I would read that, I would become indignant. What is wrong with these people? I'd be, I'd be angry. You know, you get kind of into these stories, and you're like, why are they doing this to Jesus? And then you, when things come to you that you realize that you're Barabbas. You're the one that was set free. Jesus took your place. It kind of changes the mood of the story that, thank God, Barabbas was set free because Jesus had to go to the cross to die for us. And when he died for us, it was a sacrifice, a willing sacrifice that he gave up his life for us to not only save us, but to make us the temple of God, to fill us with his spirit, to use us, to use us in a great capacity. There is no greater calling than to be a child of God and an ambassador of Christ. There's no greater calling. Little things. But together with Christ, we can do all things, right? All things. God is so good. So, one thing I want to do is, um, since there is people on Facebook, I, I do want to give a salvation prayer. I, I'm certain everyone here is saved, but I want to make sure that people who are watching on Facebook, if it's even running, have that opportunity, because that is the most important thing. It's the most important decision you can make in your life is to make a decision to live for Christ, to follow him. So, if we could just... I'm just going to have you all bow your heads, and if you could just repeat after me. I'm just going to say a very simple, short prayer. And what this prayer is, is just simply a decision in your heart. So, Heavenly Father, go ahead and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I call upon the name of Jesus, and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe that you raised him from the dead. I receive the free gift of eternal life. By faith, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you said that prayer, please please write to us uh, or, or notify us. We would love to hear... hear um, from you, um, there's no greater decision. I tell that to the youth kids. I said, there's two, two big decisions in your life. One is to receive Christ. The other one is who you marry. <laughs> you know, little decisions will have big impacts on you. Yeah, I, I did good. <laughs> um, and I appreciate you, again, all of you this morning. It, it's, it's such a blessing to to be here to minister. And I know my message was a little bit short. My wife said everyone would be happy about it. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, but God is so good. God is so good. And I just want to be obedient to him. And so if you just go ahead and bow your heads just for a minute, I'm just going to pray and make sure that I'm doing everything God wants me to do this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Hey, honey. Hey, honey. Thank you, Jesus. Arlette, could I just, can we just pray with you? Would that be okay? Can we have you come up here? 
or do you want me to come to you? Would that be easier? We'll just have you come right here. How's that? Jesus. I'm doing that. You go ahead and sit. Thank you, Father.